Hey everybody, it's Ian. I work at the Fort Worth Public Library and this is the Maker Showcase. Remember that we do the Maker Showcase every second Saturday of the month and we feature a new maker each month. This month I have Anne, who I'm super excited to have. Hi Anne, how are you? Hi Ian, I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. Again, thank you for being here and I'm excited to talk to a fellow quilter. I may have kind of revealed your maker talent a little bit already, but what is your maker talent and what do you do? Well, these days I make quilts and I knit and I was trained as a painter. I went to art school for a long time um, and I had a great background from my mother of being a maker of she loved to sew and knit and do needlepoint. So kind of all my life I've been making one thing or another. Yeah, I definitely have been a maker uh, all my life in one form or fashion as well. All right. So you are a quilter, but let's start, let's start towards the beginning of your maker career, I guess I will say. Uh, you mentioned that you started off painting. Where, where did you get started in that and how did that kind of progress? Well, I mean, you know, I was doing textiles with my mother, but you couldn't call that serious then back in the 60s or 70s. I mean, and it, it didn't seem to me like it could be a focus of my life, but it wasn't unrelated that I majored in art in college and learned to draw from the figure at Middlebury College. And then I went to a wonderful art school in New York City, the New York Studio School, where we also drew and painted from the model, but not to learn rendering, rather to confront the uncertainties of perception and bring your own responses out um, and to consider all that in the context of contemporary art and art history. Um, and I also have an MFA in painting and a master's degree in art history. Um, so I painted from the model when I was in art school and then I ha developed a few different series of still lifes on my own later when I was out of school. And um, one of them has to do with stripes, which is kind of interesting because my quilts use stripes now, but I was painting still lifes um, on striped fabrics, standing fairly close to them. So the stripes did funny things, interesting things behind the objects. And I liked the combination of the pattern with the objects. Yeah, your quilt definitely, now that you mentioned that and looking at the photos of your paintings versus some of the, the quilts that we'll be showing today during our interview, uh, I definitely see the correlation between them. And I didn't even realize that until you said that, how very interesting. Now, backing all the way up to your childhood, you worked with your mom and in textiles. Did you, what, what did you want to be when you quote unquote, I say quote, grow up because I'm, I'm still not sure what I want to be when I grow up, but what did you want to be when you were growing up? Well, actually, I remember having a kind of a dream or a fantasy about being an art teacher, um, which did happen. I mean, I did teach painting at Hollins College in Roanoke, Virginia and Syracuse University. Um, so there was that. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's it's interesting how many people's childhoods play that little bit that gets them into their future career. All right, so you went to art school, you were a painter for a little while. What made the transition from painter to uh, fiber artist, quilting, all that? Well, I had been kind of knitting all along um, while I was painting, but not taking it seriously. But in some ways I started to take painting too seriously. And this sometimes still happens to me with quilts of, I just get really stubborn with an idea and I've kind of painted myself into a corner, metaphorically speaking, and I can't get out. And at that time in my early thirties, I didn't know the things I know now about how to be flexible and how to revise and how to be patient with the process of making something like I kind of wanted it all there immediately. And if it wasn't, then I would 
beat myself up in a not very good way that I was sort of able to recognize. So I said, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. And it was kind of a early midlife crisis of, well, I thought I was a painter and I'm not a painter. So what do I do now? But um, it, um, to go on from there, I knew of the quilt maker, Michael James, then my mother had taken classes at craft centers where he had taught and um, she, uh, there were, he taught classes very near her. So I took several classes with him, but they were in color and design, not quilt making per se. And I was just thinking, well, oh, this could help me with my knitting. And at that point I was very serious about fair knitting, um, which was a kind of intermediary, intermediate phase between painting and quilting. Um, but I really loved his work. And I also was on a, had an internship having to do with public art and he had submitted his work to be considered for a, a motor vehicle office. And I was allowed to call him up and say, well, we'd really like to see you and your work. So um, I got to meet him that was in the mid eighties. And um, his work has meant a lot to me, the work he used to do that has to do with combined color sequences. That's so awesome. And I, you know, you talk about colored sequences and stuff. I mean, you looking at the quilt behind you, you can see that there are some similarities in color sequences. What it really inspires you when you're creating your quilt creations? Well, color, <laughs> that's the short answer. That's the, I mean, but color and composition and, you know, uh, trying to make something that means something to me. So, but, and I am using what I learned in art school um, as far as, well, I mean, I've just spent so much time with so many artists whose work means so much to me of Matisse and Bonnard and Hans Hoffman and Giacometti and um, all the abstract expressionists, um, you know, so the whole thing about dynamic forces and keeping it open while you're working on it so that anything can change is stuff I learned in, you know, or in art school and have developed more. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like you kind of latch onto an idea, looking at some of your work, you kind of latch onto an idea or a concept and you kind of focus around a little uh, focus around that for a little bit um for instance your series that has food titles to them um it, it seems like you kind of play with that idea can you talk a little bit more about that yeah um i'm trying to think oh what was the first one but maybe it was one of the ones that um is about cake. Um, so, and here I'll just hold up a bit of it. Um, I hope you can hope you can see it. Uh, so, and that actually came. There's another artist whose work I love, Wayne Tebow, T H I E B A U D, and he came to prominence as a pop artist, and he was painting cakes and pies. And I mean, there's also something that maybe that wasn't the first food one, but anyway, that works for me of bite-sized pieces of food and bite-sized patches of cloth. And then, you know, food, I mean, we all eat, right? I mean, it's very, we have to eat. It's daily, it's constant. And, you know, if you're lucky, it's delicious and satisfying. But, um, you know, so to evoke a world of deliciousness is, is you know, a thrill to be able to do. Absolutely. And, and the one behind me is on the theme of melon. I mean, it's fairly abstracted, but those pink circles with the black dots are watermelon interiors and the green radiating stripes are watermelon exteriors and um, the oranges are kind of cantaloupes. And then you know, I had to throw in a few more things so that the colors would work. But um, it's a it's a topic I really like. And it's interesting how you represent them because someone looking at like, say for instance, the quilt behind you, you know, when you, when you mentioned what they were, people are going to make that instant connection. But if you didn't have somebody in front of you that told you the name of the quilt or whatever, um, it might be, you know, you might get a completely different interpretation of it. 
So the quilt behind you, if someone walked up to it, didn't have a nameplate, didn't have any information about it, you know, maybe they might pick up on that watermelon theme or maybe they might not. It, it, it's really interesting how abstract, but yet, you know, when you know what it is, you see it immediately. But if you didn't know what it was, it could be construed completely different. So um, how do you kind of work through that series and, and play around with those concepts? Well, the title is important to me, actually, and I spend a lot of time thinking about the title. I mean, it's, you know, a two or three word poem, but I will consult my poet friends, for example. Um, and the there's two sort of main series that I've been involved with, and the one behind me is kind of a hybrid. So one series has to do with food and the other has to do with the cosmos. And I suppose each one was just an accident or it's just what happened of I was looking at Tebow and I realized I could do it with hexagons and I did one and then I did another and then it led to more. I did one about pie and one about Swiss chard and one about carrots. Um, and then the circular ones, I was in a, a kind of a round robin group and we all did circles for a year and passed those projects around and I used stripes for the circles and they just looked like planets. They just did. It was a kind of, you know, a, a, a happy accident, a miraculous discovery. So then I just thought, you know, what if I do it this way? And what if I do it that way? And, you know, I, the idea of being able to represent the cosmos, like that's a big thrill, at, you know, just with circles, like that is just so exciting to me. It keeps me going of, you know, I can, I'm trying to make something meaningful. And that's like, you know, who are we? What are we doing here? What is yeah, the it, can, moon, it can get really deep. What is the moon meant through the ages? I mean, or whatever, they're just circles and it's just a design. I mean, they're, they're just an abstract thing in many ways, but then I put this other meaning there too. Yeah, for sure. And and it's really cool. I, I love your work because you you play with those circles in such interesting ways and mix them with the stripes. And I, I don't know. It's just to me, it's really super cool. There's another planet one here with stripes. I mean, I guess you can only see some of it at one time, but this was sort of one of the earlier ones when I realized, oh, I could real. Oh, that's actually upside down, but it doesn't matter very much. Um, when I realized I can make planets, it's so cool. And I have a big thing for this African fabric that has birds, um, this kind of fabric. And I've this is the backing of a quilt right now, but I, it, I've used that bird fabric in um, many of those quilts. Um, and that kind of dates from, I think I can show you the bird. Can you see the bird? Yeah, that looks great. Good. Um, I did go get a chance to go to Africa and visit a friend in the Peace Corps. I wasn't quilting then, but everybody loves fabric in Africa. All the women are swathed in, in fabric, and I brought some fabric with birds back with me. That means a lot to me. Oh man, that is uh, that. Yeah, that's got to mean a lot to you, and and being able to use it in your pieces as well. That's got to be super cool. Uh, yeah, that I. For me, as a quilter, circles are hard. <laughs> circles are so hard for me to get the, the handle of being able to incorporate them into my work. So uh, I consider myself a modern quilter. And a lot of people have, you know, there's that definition of what is a modern quilter. And everybody has a little bit of a different take because I, I don't think there's been, there's a kind of a define, defining definition of what is a modern quilter? Do you consider yourself a modern quilter or what do you kind of consider yourself? Well, I don't necessarily think we need labels. I mean, I'm a quilter and I'm alive today and I'm making things now, so that's modern. And to tell the truth, my initial reaction to the modern quilt movement was not that positive. The minimalism of it just really didn't appeal to me. I don't think less is more, although you know, the more quilters I've gotten to know and uh, the more I do admire it. And there is, of course, always something to be said for, you know, minimalism or, you know, knowing when to stop. Um, but I, I really do value the emphasis on your doing your own work and your own original designs. And I think there's a kind of freedom in the modern quilt movement that 
isn't found among traditional quilters who are trying to do something close to the past or among art quilters who have an aesthetic of their own, like no geometry allowed. I don't understand that. Like geometry has always been part of quilting. You know, I love geometry. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And a lot of times, I, I at least for me, I consider myself a modern quilter, but I, I love to use bright colors. And that that tends to be one of the one of the signs that you're a modern quilter, do you find yourself uh, going back to a specific color palette that you like? No, I mean, I, you know, when I taught art, I would tell my students, you know, there are no bad colors or ugly colors. It all has to do with what you put next to each other. And also when I was in college, my art teacher said this koan like thing that I've never forgotten of, there are 14 million colors that are right and 14 million colors that are wrong. Um, so, but tell me again, what was your question about color per se? Was there a specific color palette oh. that you liked working with? No, because I mean, I am influenced by the seasons. So I will, you know, make a different kind of quilt in the summer, brighter than I will in the fall, which might be darker or duller and each, quilt has its own palette and those colors, you know, have their own demands and lead you in places that you won't expect either. Yeah, that's a really I fun see, That one was very summery. I was like, everything was green when I did that. Okay, I'll make a green world in the summer. Yeah, tell me the inspiration. I think you did, um, um, I, I don't remember the name of it, please forgive me, but there's, I, it's something like moon over water or something like that and has several different moons in it. Well, that's the whole cosmic series and there's one here called many moons, which is um, the cover image of my website. And um, so it, I can only show you a part of it at a time. Is that the one you meant? Um, yeah, that's the one. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, that I had done the one I showed you that had the bird. I think I had done that one prior to it, and I hadn't done one that was big yet. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine said, you should make a quilt called Many Moons. And, uh, you know, that was just such a great idea for a title. But that's what they all have is a whole lot of circles, and which could be a moon or a sun or a planet or other celestial orbs we don't know about yet. I don't know. And, and the other thing that's that's always fascinated me is the kind of the way the macro is in the micro and vice versa. You know, an orange, a cantaloupe is the same shape as the moon. Um, so it the circle thing is uh, is just fun to play around with. And you know, there's some kind of mystery to what moonlight is, and then how to represent it and or, you know, what the sky is. So I'm just fooling around with that. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. I I love, I, again, I just love the circles. It's, it's a lot of fun and how they interact with each other in each piece so differently is so amazing. Now you talked a little bit about some people that inspired you. Are there other people that have inspired you or other things in your world that have inspired your work? Well, I mean, uh, as I said, there's all of art history. And then with quilting, there's Michael James. And then there was my mother. Um, and friends of mine who are quilters and painters, their work inspires me. And some of the people I went to art school with have followed a similar trajectory of going from painting landscape to doing abstract geometric or geometric abstraction. Um, uh, so everything and anything inspires me. Nature, I mean, right now I'm in Massachusetts and there's beautiful golden leaves on the trees against the sky. Um, and also, I mean, I did, in my knitting phase, I did go to Shetland um, and I met the older women there who had, I mean, this was in the 90s, I think, but who had been knitting in the 20s when a craze for fair isle knitting first uh, um, arose. Um, so, you know, anybody whose work I like inspires me. 
That's awesome. What are some similarities between quilting and knitting? And obviously, obviously they seem to go hand in hand with your work. So what are some similarities for you? Well, geometry, basically. Um, uh, this is a sweater that I knitted that is the most complicated one I ever made. Um, and it's, well, I wrote a book on knitting and I thought it was right here. But anyway, it's, this one is not in my book, The Art of Farrell Knitting. Um, but I was really happy to move on from knitting where, you know, it's totally linear. And I know enough about knitting. I used to joke when I worked at a yarn store that I have an MD in knitting. You know, I could fix a patch of something without taking the whole thing out. But quilting is much freer of I can work on any part of it at any time and take apart any part of it at any time. So, yeah. and, and you know, at least you don't have to make the quilt fit somebody, which is also a challenge with knitting. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what I like about quilting is you can, you can make it and don't have to worry about it sizing to them. And most of the time people like quilts that are bigger than them that they can snuggle into. So that is definitely an advantage for quilting to say the least. Yeah, the other thing for me is when I was painting, my work was fairly small and um, people were always, men were always telling me, you should paint bigger. You know, there's a kind of heroism, a macho quality in it, or there was, you know, there was, we've come a long way in the art world in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, but, you know, I couldn't paint bigger then. It's harder to paint a big painting. And, and, and there's something wonderful about the intimacy of marks in a painting. But I am really happy that now I can work big. And it is very satisfying to work big, to work on something that's enveloping visually. I mean, I don't sleep. Well, I, there, I do have a quilt on my bed. But the ones that I make very seriously work on forever, I don't sleep on the under those, uh, with those. Yeah, and, and that may be something that people don't realize is that quilting isn't just for something for people to put on their beds. There's there's a whole genre of art quilts that are definitely not intended to be slept under and that they are used for art purposes. So uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I, I like to make quilts that people can use for the most part, but there are like yourself, people out there who do want to have quilts that are intended to hang and display rather than an actual uh, a bed quilt, if you will. Well, I do make quilts for gifts, you know, baby quilts or some whatever, some kind of commemoration. Um, but, you know, even if it's an art quilt, I don't really love that term, but um, uh, uh, there's still something, you know, uh, tactile about it that relates to the comfort of having something to cuddle up in. Or, you know, to me also like, fabric is a lot like skin. I mean, it's just very attractive and, and wonderful to touch. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of the hard parts about going to any quilt show is having to be very mindful not to touch the quilts, even though, you know, you see all those different fabrics and their different textures and the, the way that people have worked with them and quilted them. And, it's so hard to just, you can't touch them. I mean, obviously there's good reason why you can't touch it, but it, it's just amazing to see all the different textures and you, you're, you just, your brain wants to be able to, uh, I guess in a way, comprehend them even more by being able to touch them. But if you go to a quilt show, don't touch the quilts. <laughs> All right, so if somebody is interested in getting started in quilting, obviously you don't want to run out to the store and buy the most expensive machine and all that kind of stuff for getting started. So what kind of resources would you suggest for someone who's interested in becoming a quilter or quilting or just explore a little bit? Well, a fabric store near you that offers classes is a great place to start and all the conventions that there are now have fantastic classes. And I do belong to two local guilds. And I mean, I've belonged to one of them for at least 20 years and I'm not quite as involved with those people and the people they're bringing in as I used to be, but I, they were great educational opportunities of speakers whose work I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And I started out with a singer that had been in my family for a long time and a very small stash. But, 
you know, I would say take a class with a teacher whose work you love, which is what I did with Michael James. On the other hand, I haven't yet mentioned, I did make a few quilts in the 1970s and I was lucky enough to have seen the show that was at the Whitney Museum in 1971, Abstract Designs in American Quilt. So in general, you know, just look at as much stuff as you can for inspiration. Absolutely. And uh, when I was a, a theater student, my lighting professor told us to have a lighting morgue. And basically that morgue was, we would just collect images that we liked and that inspired us. And putting those into a binder kind of helped inspire me when I needed to, when I had an assignment or I had a show that I needed to work on, I would go through my morgue and figure out, oh, I like that. Let's, let's use that in some way. So uh, collecting things that you like, whether it be pictures, music, whatever, can really help inspire, at least in, in, from what, my experience. Or fabric. <laughs> there you go. I, I have a really big fabric stash that I, I am terrified to cut into and I need to get myself over that, but it happens, right? <laughs> um, and thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Is there some place people can find you online? I do have a website, which is my name. So it's annfiedelson.com, which is A-N-N-F-E-I-T-E-L-S-O-N.com. And I have an Instagram page, which is my last name first, Fiedelson Ann. Um, but there's more on my website there than there is on my Instagram page. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me. And I really hope everybody goes and check out, checks out your website because there's a lot of great things there. Thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you too, Ian. Excellent. Don't forget, guys, we do the Maker Showcase every second Saturday. So come back next month and see who our guest will be. Bye. <laughs>